Welcome to the Great Hall and to the uh, Climate Crisis Panel Debate. Uh, my name is David Mile and uh, I'm a student sustainability architect here. Um, before I even tell you where the emergency exits are, I just want to say a big thank you to our panel who are going to introduce themselves more fully in a moment. So James, Anna, Megar and, and Alice, thank you all very much indeed. Um, the, the format for today, I'm not going to speak for very long actually. My job here is, as I say, is just to um, make sure that the questions that have come through various, uh, various channels uh, are put to, put to put the panel who are far more knowledgeable about this than, than I am and I, I guess I will ever be. So I'm not going to sp spend very long saying why climate change and, climate, and the climate crisis is the most significant uh, issue facing humanity. I think we, we can all appreciate its, its, its gravity, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So, to cut that short, and I'm, I'm just going to um, ask straight away for each of our panel to introduce ourselves, and then we'll, we'll crack on with some questions which, uh, which, we've, which we've already got planned, and then there'll be a chance for people to, to grab one of, the ro one of the roaming mics and, and feed into the conversation that way. So uh, if, we, if, if we could kick off with you, James. Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm James Dixon Goff, uh, one of the university sustainability managers. Uh, so my my role is kind of managing um, some of the operational sustainability impacts at the university and that can include everything through to kind of managing kind of uh, stuff that's going on in our construction pro projects, kind of uh, environmental management systems, um, kind of the products that we buy, but also energy and climate change. And over the last six to, six to 12 months really, I've been spending uh, kind of increasing amount of my time um, putting together proposals for a climate plan um, which will respond to the university's seven principles. So I guess that's where I'm, I'm coming from uh, today. Um, my name's Anna and my name and I work for the United Bank of Carbon which is an environmental charity based mostly at the University of Leeds and the charity um, does research and communicates the results of the research to the um, white other organisations, external organisations and it's all to do with trees in relation to climate mitigation. So forestry protection, um, planting new forests um, and protecting urban trees as well. So my role is specifically in the UK and looking at the wider benefits and the natural capital of urban trees. Um, hello, my name is Nagar. I am a master's student here and studying sustainability and consultancy. Uh, the project that I was uh, researching today was uh, around the cleaning services and how they can reduce their single-use plastics um, as a sustainability architect on campus. Hello, uh, my name's Alice Owen. I appear to be the token academic for the afternoon, so uh, that's actually quite a nice position to be in for a change. Um, I, I'm an associate professor in the Sustainability Research Institute, and amongst other things, and probably most relevant for this audience, uh, I work a lot with industry and consultancies in organizing the industry sustainability projects for the sustainability and consultancy program that Negar is on. Um, I think, with your forbearance, I'll just say a little bit about my background, because it might help um, in terms of conversation about what what we need to develop to do, to do things differently in response to climate crisis. And it's, um, I just wanted to say that I, I started out as an engineer. Uh, my original training was as an engineer and the really, uh, my first jobs were in the really nasty end of the chemical commodity business. So I have no illusions about the challenges that uh, our production processes and the products that we use actually pose to the environment broadly. Um, I did an MBA um, and have worked in the third sector at all sorts of uh, knowledge exchange for charities and I've worked, also worked in public policy at local, regional and UK national level. So I guess what I wanted to say is I've done a lot of stuff um, before starting my PhD when my son started school and um, I think that that's quite important to have a common thread through what you do, and mine's sustainability and environmental management, but you can get, get at that through a lot of different means, I, see, I guess is the, the reason I wanted to just say that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I'm just going to kick off with a, a question for, for you all. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, question is, 
What, what are common misconceptions people have about the climate crisis and what can we do to dispel those misconceptions and communicate more effectively? James? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, I think something that comes up quite a lot is the idea of, um, I guess, single issues um, that people kind of hook onto around climate change. Um, and there almost seems to be this kind of a belief if, that if you solve this particular issue, you will have solved climate change. Um, and I guess it's something in, in my role you come up against quite a lot. So people get in contact and they're like, if only you do this thing, um, you know, you will, have, you will have gone a long way to kind of deal with the problem. And, and I guess for me, um, the kind of the, my kind of take from that and the thing I like to say is that actually this is an incredibly complex issue and that we need to look at and tackle um, everything kind of available really through from food to transport, um, energy and consumption. So for me, that's my kind of big myth that you can deal with this just by a one particular issue. Anna? From my point of view, um, I think the, from a tree point of view, there's a, 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 a big movement now to um, plant trees and it is important um, to have additional trees and an additional canopy, but it is, there is a much more complex picture than that. And actually looking after the existing tree canopy is just as important. And there's other work as well, which um, in terms of hedgerows, and, but trees are really important. The large stature, long-lived trees are doing the heavy lifting now, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of them as well as doing additional tree planting. Um, I think a common misconception for me and some other people that I've spoken to is the idea that we feel as students may be quite small and that our change, our small actions won't really affect anything and that we might, um, it's better to wait for big government uh, policies to enact change and that we should follow. But I think um, actually this power of student voice and the power of the collective to come together and say that no, we need to change this now is um, a big, big important thing, and that any um, small changes that you do will have increment, like as they add up, they'll result to something much bigger. Okay, so I need something different, right? And so, <laughs> so let's just actually, I'll pull up, pick up on a couple of the, uh, finesse those. So one of the things I'd say to Anna's point is um, that trees are really useful. We all love trees. Trees are really important. I get that. Let's not kid ourselves that trees are the answer. <laughs> That's like, we can, cover, if we could cover the kind of surface area of the UK in trees, we would still have a job to do in dealing with the kind of root causes and issues of the climate crisis and our response to it. So I'm not dissing trees, I'm just saying they're not the whole picture. Um, and this point about who, how do you make a difference? Are you big enough to make a difference? I think there's something really interesting here because a, a thing I hear a lot, there's two twin things, one of which is um, oh, there's no point doing anything because it's a big structural problem. It's China's coal power stations and Australia's uh, mining of resources and, you know, those can't, there's no point doing anything while those things are still in play. And yet at the same time, we also try and, when it's all a bit difficult, and it does, let's face it, it is all a bit difficult, we kind of go, oh well, um, I can't do anything so somebody else will sort it out. So government policy will provide the answer for us or, you know, claiming, proclaiming a climate emergency and setting a target of net zero, job done. And that's so far from job done. So I think for me, the misconception and the thing we need to kind of grapple with is actually, so what does an individual do around day in, day out choices? What does an individual do that actually does influence some of those bigger infrastructure issues? So what's the role of an individual voice building into a collective voice to change the infrastructure and the policy and the like? And, and then how do we break out of our little individual silos into really novel conversations in innovation, which maybe discover that maybe the world looks a bit different from the west coast of Australia where the whole of your economy and lifestyle is tied up with a particular set of resources and dependencies and maybe it's a bit scary to see those being dismantled and taken away. So I think we need to kind of break out of this individualistic notion in some way and not 
believe that somebody else is going to take the responsibility to make the difference, but also not reckon that we can individually, by sitting on our own, make the difference. Sense? Makes yeah. perfect sense. Thank you. <laughs> Next question is for you, is for you James. Okay. <clears throat> Going back to your earlier point about the importance of the strategic view that the university has, um, um, how do you see the university's commitment to securing net zero carbon footprint by 2030? How do you see that aligning with our internationalization strategy? Okay, uh, interesting question. I think the first thing to say is, is that actually being an international university is a really good thing. Um, you know, having <coughs> students and staff from around the world is, I don't know, I certainly feel very privileged to work in a place that, that has that. Um, I think that the second thing to say is when it comes to global issues and climate change is very much a global issue, we do need to work with each other and understand uh, each other's perspectives, um, that, that solutions can be very kind of location specific, et cetera. And again, that kind of international kind of collaboration, sharing of knowledge, et cetera, is a, is a very, um, I think a very helpful thing. Another thing I'd like to say is that actually we, we seem to be living in a time where society is becoming kind of increasingly polarized. Um, there's a resurgence of nationalism, those types of things. Again, I think, um, kind of having kind of an internationally connected uh, university kind of can help to kind of counter some of those things. So that's kind of my, I suppose, my statement around actually, I don't think that is a bad thing to say. I suppose the thing that we do have to manage within that is the fact that um, international connections, research, travel, etc., does have an impact. Um, and it's an impact that's growing and it relates to flying and flying is a very tricky thing to do something with. It's very hard to reduce emissions. Um, it's very hard to develop technology that will do so. So, um, but to kind of go alongside that, it is something that not only um, is the university very serious about looking at, I think the whole sector is. So funders are starting to look at the impact related to travel to the research grants that they award. Um, the HD sector is collectively starting to think about how we, how we deal with issue, this issue, and we're starting to think about how we can do it. So that'll be things around um, improving the communication technology that we use, so you don't always have to travel. And I guess the other thing will be thinking about the, the impact of the journeys that we make and balancing that against kind of, kind of the impact of the emissions associated with those journeys. Um, and it might be that in the future we need to, we need to do some of those journeys kind of slower um, maybe we need to kind of meet less frequently, but do that with kind of more intent and more quality. Um, so I think it's complicated, and I don't have a, you know, a definite answer to it, um, and I hope I've explored some of the, kind of the ideas around mm. it, but we are committed, the HE sector is committed, um, and there are some, some areas I think we can start working on straight okay. away. Yeah. Where, where do you see the, the uh, quickest wins coming from? Uh, the quickest wins? Um, I, I don't think it's a particularly quick win, but I think um, improving the technology that people can yeah. use to communicate is a fairly quick win. Um, I think beyond that, we, we're getting into the realms of kind of quite hard decisions, and I think we are going to kind of collectively need to start thinking about, well, how do we assess the impact of a you know, type of journey? Can we set kind of carbon budgets within schools mm -hmm. to try and initially encourage kind of reductions, those types of things? Okay. Um, I don't think any of them are quick wins, though, okay. unfortunately. I think it is tricky. Yeah. yeah. But it's good to hear that the sector's taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. is, yeah. Um, changing tack slightly, and building on an earlier comment from, from Alice, um, Anna, we couldn't have you here without asking you a tree-related question, so that's what we're going to do. Is planting more trees the answer? It's part of the answer. Okay. It's a qualified yes. <laughs> Um, the, um, as we know, trees are the cost of, most cost-effective way of taking carbon dioxide out of the air. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are trying to invent other ways of doing it, but trees do it very well and for a, a relatively small amount of money. Um, and they are storing that carbon in a way that we can then do something sensible with if we think about it after the tree dies, say, using it in building and furniture but it is very much part of the answer. So 
when the Committee on Climate Change has taken the International Panel on Climate Change's um, figures and looked across the whole of the UK and said that in that um, tree planting and the tree canopy cover in the UK should go from 13%, which is very low compared to U our European um, colleagues. So it's 1, 3, 13. 1, 3, 13. Okay. Um, to 17 to 19% increase okay. in tree canopy cover. Now this is a, a substantial increase, but similar planting levels were done in the 70s and the 80s, so we have been there before. So that amounts to 30,000 to 50,000 hectares a year of additional tree planting, and that is a substantial landscape change. And there's other things bundled up with that, it's not just trees, there's hedgerows, peatland restoration and woodland management. Um, there's also um, other benefits associated with trees, as we know, biodiversity and if it's accessible to urban areas and people, it's health and well-being and a lot of other sort of co-benefits to include in that. And there are also structures for formally offsetting against trees. Um, and this can be done for um, so the people who are sort of causing the emissions can then offset by planting forests. But the danger is greenwash. The danger is, as Alice pointed out, that if the aviation industry wanted just to plant trees and carry on as they are, there wouldn't be enough room in the UK. You just can't do it. So it's part of the package and it is a case of reducing emissions in every way you can, and trees are only um, really relevant in, say, heavy industry, agriculture, and essential aviation, where, where it's very difficult to find an alternative um, okay. method. And the other thing to think about is we are very quick, we are assuming in this that the existing canopy cover is stable, and that is not the case. We are actually probably going backwards in terms of our trees. Um, say it's pest and disease. With an example, um, I was involved in a project on campus, a sustainability living lab project, where we measured every single tree on campus. And um, we have 8% of the trees on campus are ash trees. And there's a particular disease at the moment that means we're very likely in the next few years to lose 95% of them. And that's 61 tonnes of carbon on campus that we then need to find other ways to mitigate. Um, and then we've got other things such as um, the large stature long-lived trees. They're doing the heavy lifting. And while we plant small trees, there's a time delay of decades before they're really contributing. So keeping the existing trees, who are, who are the Cinderella's in our landscape, caring for them in terms of the slightly higher up the policy list when it comes to development. And um, so for example, just one example, um, we measured 1,450 trees on campus, but the top 100 trees do over a third of the carbon storage and the carbon sequestration, so that's 7%. And these are the big trees. So it's really making um, people more aware that, that um, we need to look after what we've got as well as plant more. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Moving down the line, Naga, um, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on the university's announcement about these seven principles for um, addressing climate crisis and what would you like to see next? What, what, what more do you feel needs to be achieved or committed to and then achieved by the institution? Um, I think it's quite a uh, bold and ambitious uh, seven criteria that they have, especially with the net zero of 2030, which is a lot sooner than what the IPCC recommends, um, as well as incorporating sustainability into the learning structure and having um, it taught into uh, a lot of the courses that aren't typically taught about climate change and, and issues. Like uh, earlier today, I went to a talk which was um, about five or six students describing their journey into sustainability, all from different faculties. Um, and just having, I think, sustainably taught is a bold um, goal that the university wants to do, and I think it's much needed to create the changes that we want. We need everyone on board. We're going to be working with people in all industries, and we need to embed sustainability into the projects that we do from the get-go. I think something that's missing is in the seventh goal, they, um, the university states they want to be more transparent in their um, investments in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, so it would be nice to have more transparency on what those investments are and how they're contributing to the Paris Agreement. Um, 
is something that I find missing. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts about the transparency issue? I think it's quite a, it's quite a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? As to, as to how far you should, you should extend your reach as, a, as an institution and what you invest in. And do, are there any other thoughts on, on, on our investment por portfolio and what, and, what that, and what we should or shouldn't be investing in as an institution? I, I think, um, fr from my perspective, and I think um, everybody I work with, we are keen to be transparent. Yeah. I think sometimes the, the difficulty we face is how do you do that? How do you actually get that information out there? And also, universities are kind of quite complicated places to work at and, and to communicate around. So, and then I suppose the third thing is we're also trying to kind of um, develop these plans at the same, the same time. So I think we've kind of got this sort of very complicated mix of not how do we do transparency well, like how do we communicate well with a university, and also you know what the, what the heck are we 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 do at the moment and what we what we're going to commit to. So I think yeah, absolutely, it's really important. I think it is it is a focus. So I don't have an answer at the moment, but it is an answer we're going to have to come up with, and we we absolutely will be committing to reporting around our commitments at, at an absolute minimum on an annual basis. But um, I you know definitely I would say kind of more regularly than that. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Alice. Moving along the line, um, you mentioned earlier that you're, you, you've, you've had many strings to your bow, I suppose, and, and that you're, you're, you're responsible for the sustainable uh, consultancy um, uh, uh, program. I was wondering, within that, and have you noticed any significant shift in the level of emphasis that businesses are looking for in terms of the sustainability agenda? And how can we respond to that as students? How can, how can we become kind of uh, more valuable uh, to, to those that are, I one would imagine, more committed to, to sustainability than they have been in the past. So I think drawing on, I've been involved in this process for seven whole years now, which is enough to go around a, the cycle a few times. And um, I think that what we're, the thing I'd observe is that perhaps there's been a shift from businesses and employers, not just businesses, but a range of employers, perhaps moving their focus away from um, being able to communicate about climate change or sustainability or being able to articulate it to the skills that enable you to take action about it. I mean, a few years ago, there were a lot of sustainability jobs in corporate affairs and communications. Um, and they are still there, but they are now serving a, an investor community, a project development community, a business development community. So I think there's been a shift in the, from knowing the content about sustainability issues to, right, how do we take action on those? Okay. And I think that's particularly true with um, carbon accounting and climate change, where probably five years ago, you could still afford to be at the cutting edge of knowing what scope one, two, and three emissions were and drawing and understanding kind of what, what the carbon emissions associated with your business model are. Whereas now, I think most uh, organizations are interested in kind of going, yeah, we, we get it, we get there's a problem, so what are we gonna do? And as a result, the, the skills and knowledge, I'd say there are probably um, two aspects of this. You do still need a core technical knowledge. And I don't mean by technical knowledge that arts and humanities knowledge doesn't play a really important role. Clearly, it does. But it's about understanding the system that is manifesting climate change and what's driving that. So why is where we get an energy from, our energy from an issue, um, what's driving energy demand and use anyway, uh, those just understanding the, the energy and climate system, I think is a, a technical type of competence that's really, really important to have as a baseline knowledge. But then alongside that, however that's manifest for you, whatever your particular aspect of that is, you need, I think, to have the portfolio of skills that enable you to take that knowledge and do something with it, whether it's around properly engaging with people rather than just shouting at them in a, you know, in a kind of hectoring way, whether it's about taking a complex, messy problem and turning it into a 
bit of a solution and calling that a project with a beginning, a middle and an end and a set of people who are going to do things for particular outcomes. Um, kind of, yeah, chunking down complex stuff into digestible chunks that you can work with, are tractable, but still build to something bigger and more significant. So those kind of, what you could consider quite generic business management and project management skills, I think are really the ones that coupled with a, a kind of core technical understanding of what the system's doing is, is the thing that we need to develop. The other thing I'd add, though, is let's not lose sight of the fact that there are two dimensions to the climate emergency. The one that currently gets most attention is around net zero climate mitigation, cutting uh, carbon equivalent emissions, um, and that is clearly an imperative. Let's not lose sight, though, that even if we turn off all the lights tomorrow and you know, change our economic system overnight, we've still got 40 or 50 years of climate change that's already in train from the last couple of hundred years of economic activity globally. So we also need, I think, to keep an eye on the adaptation and resilience set of responses. And I think currently they're being crowded out of the climate emergency um, thinking and because net zero has necessarily grabbed attentions. So I think keeping that awareness of an understanding of the way in which the world will continue to change for the next four to five decades um, is an important part of being an effective change agent around this stuff. It's a very interesting point. I think the, the, ad the adaptation uh, issue, as you say, isn't, it doesn't receive the same prominence as the mitigation uh, argument. And yet it is and yet it is also the thing that enables that makes people realise, oh goodness, actually the, 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 my day to day behaviours are impacting either on my business or my life or my family mm. or whatever it might be. And so actually thinking about adaptation and resilience is a really um, tangible way to understand the climate emergency and understand, therefore, and perhaps get a greater motivation to tackle these difficult issues sure. of mitigation. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, the, this, this is the last of, the, of my questions before we, we open things up to the floor, and it's, it's, it's one for all of you. Um, there are lots of words written down here. I'm just going to say something very simple, which is What's your advice for people that want to progress in a sustainable career or in a career that helps address through either mitigation or adaptation uh, the climate crisis? Words of wisdom? So specifically linked to, to career? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, to okay. thinking about the, the audience we have today and you know, what, what would help people make the right moves, I suppose? What's helped you make the right moves and what would help other people make um, the right uh, moves? I think I was always motivated um, by wanting to have a positive impact and I, I guess something that I've, I've especially noticed with kind of the generations that are coming through now actually you know look at the school strikes extinction rebellion all that kind of stuff there is like a real desire to kind of change society um, in, in, a, in, a, in a positive mm -hmm. way I think and I think by, by kind of embracing that I think you can go into any role and have a have a positive influence I don't think you have to go into a sustainability role um, but I think the other thing is you, you need to look after um, your, kind of your personal resilience in this. Climate change is pretty scary um, and can be a, kind of a quite heavy emotional burden, I think. So kind of bearing that in mind, I think it's also thinking about a role that will suit you as an individual mm -hmm. so that you think will kind of bring out the best of you. And I think if you find that, whether that's a kind of sustainability role or not, I think you will be able to influence, influence change. Okay, that's interesting. Anna? I've found, um, I've done many different jobs, and what I've found is just getting involved, volunteering. That's one of the reasons I've ended up in this current job, is I volunteered to measure the trees on campus and then ended up finishing the project off. So um, it, it's, you know, the volunteer, get involved, keep informed, and be flexible. I think that's, you know, be prepared to move jobs and think about what you're doing, and, and, and if you've got that sustainability, um, priority anyway in, in your motivation as James says I yeah. think you will find opportunities and there's lots more opportunities coming up now you know so 
lots and lots of things to do. Um, kind of to add on to that, I think the one thing that's um, motivated me is I'm always like curious and asking why things happen for um, why are things a certain way. So in any industry you're in or any project or work experience that you're doing, um, can you ask yourself like why is it this way? How can we make it better? Can we make it more sustainable? Just I think just being curious about things, everyday things around you can um, can can keep you motivated and tackle some big problems and see stuff differently. I de I'd echo that point about the curiosity actually. Um, the asking, the, the questioning of things, but also I think there's something really important about never believing that you've got all the answers. You actually have to have the humility and the willingness to continue to learn about stuff. Because if there is one thing I've learned, it's that I really, I, I know less probably now in aggregate about solutions than I probably did, it, I thought I did at the outset of my career. So there's something about um, always pursuing what you're interested in in order to become better informed. And when I look back at the variety of things that I've done, I realized that I never really asked myself whether I had the existing knowledge and skills to do a job, I thought, oh, that's an interesting job to do, and I therefore need to acquire a different set of knowledge and skills to do the job. And I think going after and doing the things that you're interested about and, and developing that habit of, well, I'm not going to know how to do it at the outset, I'm going to have to learn, and I'm going to have to find out what this beast, what this organisation is, mm. or what this topic is, is actually part of the way in which we deal with the wave after wave of difficult sustainability challenges that come towards us. So the, the endless ability to, to learn and, and be curious, but also never think you've got it cracked. Um, but couple, I would couple that with, for what it's worth, I do think it's useful for you to have a solid foundation, to know the place that you're coming from in some kind of knowledge base. I mean, for me, it is an engineering training gave me a particular way of understanding the world at the outset of my career. There will be other kind of strong foundations that people have around communication or storytelling or analysing space, uh, spatial data or understanding particular scientific principles. But I think having some kind of foundation um, that, of knowledge that helps you see the world in a particular way, as long as you acknowledge that it is a lens that you're looking through, it's not the whole picture, I think that can be really helpful because it gives you um, confidence, which at times you need, particularly when you step into an arena where you don't know quite what you're doing. And it also um, gives you legitimacy in a way because there is some stuff you know about. So that's what I okay. kind of... Don't, don't, in your quest to cover all the things, lose sight of what your kind of home territory is. Sure. But be prepared to develop that territory yeah. throughout. Yeah. Channeling curiosity and generosity of time as well and, and, and passion. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so that was the easy bit because you knew what those questions were. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Um, we should have a few roam, roaming mics. There we are. Um, anyone have anything they'd like to ask the panel? Anyone brave enough to go first? Lady here in blue. And this makes my job even easier. So thank you very much for that. Um, I was wondering, firstly, if you think there's value in creating or improving the relationship between the uni and the union in terms of making sustainability projects or making them better and if you do think it's good or would be beneficial how do you think that should be done it's a very interesting question who feels confident enough to answer that uh, i can probably answer part of it i suppose okay. it's it's a, it's a very good question um the, the kind of the quick answer is yes, absolutely. I think any kind of um, strengthening of links between sort of the union and the university is a good thing. Um, I would say that there actually already exist pretty good relationships. Um, so we, you know, um, various kind of roles in the university kind of meet very regularly with kind of union representatives to talk about kind of everything from kind of student experience through to through to sustainability. 
An example of that being the Plastic Pledge, which is a combined pledge between the university and the union. Um, however, kind of taking it kind of beyond very specific roles, um, I think there's, there's got to be scope with um, things such as kind of student societies, um, which is often like a root of, I don't know, kind of root of how you experience the, the union as a student. Um, and I think we could certainly do, do more, more with that, I think. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's, that's all I can say really without kind of making stuff up. I think, I think yeah, absolutely, we should improve it. And I think student societies could be a way, a way of doing that. Not the only way, but a way. Of course, yes. is the university structures have these great kind of set of communications to work with the, un the, uh, the student union. As an academic, you interface with that virtually, not at all, other than through Leads for Life and your personal duties and, and um, you know, kind of those. But so there's, there is another, uh, it's like the academic body isn't quite the same as the university decision making and management structures and the student okay. body in, inter, interfaces with, that, with both. And, I, and I'm not sure, and I don't know how, I, to answer the second important point, I don't know how we improve it. But I, it's, I, th it, I was thinking the other day, it's really interesting that there's clearly a lot of activity from the union. But as an academic who needs to make sure that they get their research sorted, as well as doing the student support, as well as doing their teaching, all, you know, all that stuff. And that's really not a sob story. It's the job. It's fine. Um, but you don't actually interface with the union much at all, other than around student welfare. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's an incomplete bit of the cycle okay. somehow, <clears throat> even if I don't know how we fix it. It sounds like you'd like to understand a bit more about what the union, union could offer the university. Both uh, of you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Who's next? Thank you. Yes. Oh. Thank you very much for a uh, lively conversation. And I actually uh, want to raise this uh, issue specifically for the developing country context. That uh, uh, in the say, for example, uh, Bangladesh. So it's uh, very much vulnerable in terms of climate change. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and uh, road infrastructure also very much linked to the uh, plantation, as for example. So, uh, we actually, the, uh, in Bangladesh context, uh, so plantation program is vigorously done alongside the road. So, but uh, it, it is not sustained in a way that uh, we need to infrastructure a little bit, uh, 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 I mean the broad infrastructure. So stage by stage it has been improved, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the tree cutting and the tree need to uprooting. So this one kind of the negative effect, uh, uh, though we have planted a lot uh, roadside plantation. So how this can be mitigated and uh, how this can be more sustainable in a way. Thank you very much. Sorry, is, is your question directed towards a particular member of the panel? Uh, no, uh, not actually. This uh, anybody, particularly uh, as she's, uh, I mean, the right right hand side. Uh, I think you are talking about the plantation, not the only solution to deal with. I think I think this is a question about where, in your context of Bangladesh, the tree planting. There's been a lot of it, but there's a set of factors that mean that doesn't come to to fruition. Is that right? Um, the, the, and therefore, you don't get all the multiple benefits yeah, yeah. Um, that you might need to do. So, I think it's probably a kind of practical issue about how do you develop a program that that is re respects kind of the the local pressures, the local needs, so on and so forth. Um, it's interesting because in the, in the Sustainability Research Institute, some of my colleagues working on environment and development are very much exploring, you know, landowners and infrastructure providers in the global south are dealing with a whole different set of pressures around livelihoods, around the impacts of climate change being very direct, um, and, and, that, and yet not having necessarily the power um, soft power, political power, to, to change, you know, re reaping the, re the impact of global systems rather than necessarily influencing them. I don't know whether we've got anything from the United Bank of Carbon approach that would help us kind of navigate all those multiple 
stakeholder pressures and the like? You know? I, I can think of one example, um, but it's in um, Kenya. So, but just one example, it's one of the partners that we work with, Betty's and Taylor's. And a long time ago, long before it was sort of trendy, they decided that they really needed to understand the impact of climate on their um, tea and coffee growing business. And they looked at the um, environment where the tea and coffee is grown and realized that the, if they didn't support the communities and work with them, they weren't going to have tea and coffee. And so it really was, as they said, a no-brainer to actually work with the community. And they um, then did tree planting around uh, for soil protection around certain crops. And they also then used a diversity of tree species so that then there was an opportunity to sell the fruit at the market and have a second income. And it was very much working with the community um, to build a resilience to um, generating income, keeping what was going already. And it was also a um, they did this work throughout their supply chain. So it was an example of businesses thinking carefully and in depth about the impact they're having and making it a positive impact. Does that answer your question in any Thank way? Thank you very much. I got that. Okay. Um, hi, yeah, this is a question for everyone, really. Um, so obviously there's quite an acceptance and awareness of climate change and issues of sustainability in society now. But um, there isn't necessarily um, acceptance of a need to actually change or real change necessarily being made. So it's sort of a two-part question. Um, in general society, you know, in our communities, how can we sort of in, like, encourage people to change and actually integrate it, as well as in industries as well? I'm applying to a placement, and they said one of the roles is people accept that some things need to be done, but they don't necessarily integrate it into their practices. So if anyone had any insights in how they might approach that or improve actual acceptance of real change being made, that's really my question. Shall so, so I start on that? Absolutely. So I think this is when it kind of, there's that, um, so when, when Alice was talking about um, individual action versus kind of system level um, government change and regulation, et cetera. So I think there's always going to be um, kind of early adopters, et cetera, that will, um, I don't know, change diets, uh, uh, start riding a bike rather than driving a car, all that type of stuff. But there's, there's a, there is a real segment in the, in the middle, um, so kind of resistors, um, the middle section being people that are aware of the issues but don't necessarily um, do anything about it. And I think that's where you need the, those over kind of lying systems to change to support that activity. And whether that happens at an organization level, um, a local authority level, or a government level, I think there really is a need to do that because the reality is that um, you know, people live busy lives and they might be aware of something, but quite often other um, kind of more direct, um, more urgent decisions will kind of cloud that out. So yeah, I am, I am a big believer for certainly individual action because I'm motivated around that, but also trying to kind of push for those kind of local and kind of wider systems to change to support the type of change that you were talking about. For a couple of specific kind of ideas that, that build on that, one of which is um, the phrase, I will if you will, is really powerful, I think, to keep coming back to. And um, it, it was um, explored a lot in terms of consumer action um, a decade or so ago. But the idea of, actually, I can only change, I can only buy carbon neutral tea and coffee from Betty's and Taylor's if Betty's and Taylor's have put in place the actions that mean that carbon neutral tea and coffee is available. So think about I will if you will. Un and another uh, really powerful phrase that um, a very skilled facilitator I used to work with used to use a lot is, so, so under what conditions would you do this? You'd really like to take the train to your research conference rather than hop on a plane for 30 minutes. What, under what conditions? What would it take for you to make that shift? And just by imagining the situation, well, I would really need somebody else to look after the house for three days while I sat on a train to Lesser Bavaria or whatever it might be. You start to unpack what the real core of the issue might be, which is, we, in that case, we might be requiring people to do travel that doesn't you know, sit alongside having a whole and rounded life or 
those kind of things. So, so I will, if you will, and under what conditions, I think, is, is a really helpful to, to get across. Because awareness isn't enough. Awareness just leads to guilt, right? Knowing that I should take the train just makes me feel guilty when I get on the plane because I haven't been able to make the additional choices. So those are things I'd offer. And the other one is I, I do really feel quite strongly we need to think about how do we mainstream climate sensitive action. So I work a lot with the construction industry. There's a huge job to do in getting all our existing homes in the UK to be zero impact in terms of carbon. There are about 350,000 predominantly men with predominantly white vans driving around fixing people's homes at the moment. There is no way 350,000 people are suddenly going to get an epiphany and start doing zero carbon retrofit on, on all their houses. However, we can get a handle on why they do what they do now, which are to do with some you know, customers wanting things to look nice, to be affordable, and then we can work out how to get the low carbon stuff to be mainstream. So we have to think about understanding the current system and moving the innovation into the mainstream rather than trying to get the whole of the mainstream out to the innovation side of things. So I will, if you will, under what conditions would you change and how do we mainstream this would be, I think, my kind of starting points for, for, for getting beyond awareness and guilt. Thank you. <coughs> Any further thoughts? I think that covers it rather nicely, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question from the floor because I've got a few, not, not literally in my back pocket, but tucked away here, I've got a few um, Twitter questions as well. So, Ed, any, any further questions? Yep. Hiya. Uh, oops, that's too loud. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, individual action, which is, of course, great. But when it comes to... Um, more of a, you know, making something legal or, or installing a set of policies, code of conduct. Don't you think our, uh, you know, sustainability agenda will be far more accelerated if we had that as a law? And also, what do you think that is currently missing? I mean, um, I think one of your academics last year, Dr. Sumner, he was part of the Environmental Audit Committee that uh, presented the Fixing Fashion Report. But yeah, some of the MPs of the government, they rejected all of the 18 points. So what do you think is missing from a, a legis legislation perspective to basically make like carbon negativity illegal in a way? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, th I feel like I probably need to pick that up because yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. Of course, individual action is not enough. Um, but what I'm saying is that just regulation on its own is not enough as well without having the systems to enable people to comply. So these things absolutely have to be, have to be put alongside each other. We need the policy frame. We've got the targets, hurrah, yeah? We've got a Climate Change Act, which makes it for government statutorily required to comply with their targets. But what we don't, in the UK, what we consistently fail to do is make the long-term policy decisions that enable then all the businesses and actors and individuals to stack up behind those targets. So in terms of what's missing, I think there's two things, one of which is long-term consistent. And by long-term, I just mean more than five years, right? <laughs> but a, a, a policy framework, and that was what's amazing about the Climate Change Act 2008, you know, that actually it's stayed on the statute books and nobody's kicked it off yet. That's, that, so we're talking, we, we can do long-term policy, but certainly in construction, in most consumption, um, actually around vehicles, we've had loads of wobbles around actually doing, doing the right thing. So what's missing is a long-term approach that clearly signals this is what needs to happen, this is what it's going to happen over this time scale, which enables then everybody else to organise themselves around it and deliver. And I think the other thing is actually consistency, particularly between land use policies, industrial strategy, um, and the skills agenda. Those are all in the UK um, set out separately as different strands. We'll build our economy through an, um, 
through an industrial strategy. We'll um, develop our, our landscape and our infrastructure through a land use strategy. And we'll develop our skills and knowledge through an education strategy. And actually, those all need to talk to each other and have the goal of uh, transformation into a low-carbon society as the unifying aim. So I don't want much, but, you know, I'm quite... <laughs> Great question, though. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all those excellent questions. I'm, I'm just going to turn now to a few that have come through on, on the Twitter feed. Um, and this is not very digital, is it? <laughs> Scribbled down with my, with my handwriting saying, this one's for James. So I'll start with this one's for James, which is, um, how is the university going to report on its seven principles for action on the climate crisis? What's the plan? Well, I suppose I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so currently we report on a kind of a range of kind of sustainability objectives in our annual report. So that, that information is really out there for scope one and two emissions and some scope, scope three. But um, I think with the kind of the weight of the expectation around the seven principles, we're, we're aware we're going to kind of need to maximize that. Um, how we do that is, to be honest, yet to be decided, but as I said earlier, it will be at least once a year. Um, it will be, I think, in pretty multiple formats, but we, we are absolutely looking at, or we will be looking at ways to report on that stuff more regularly. And actually, we, we want to involve you all in delivering this stuff as well, and to do that, you need to know like, what we're progressing on, how we're doing against it, and where you can help. Um, and we can't, we can't only do that once a year, we need to do that more regularly. Um, okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So there's a question here, which I think is a great question, which is, who should lead climate change action? Which I'm, I'd love to pose to you, but I'd also like to supplement that by asking, how do you show leadership? What's a, what's a good way of showing leadership on, on the issue of climate change? What, what's a good way of leading by example, as well as uh, the question of who should be leading on climate change? Where should we start? Should we start in the middle? Okay. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think um, a good way of leading is by taking the values that you have and putting them into your everyday lives. If you see someone as, a, as incorporating sustainability into their, into their lives, um, it's, an, it's a good way to, to showcase that, that leadership. Mm -hmm. And if someone's um, incorporating their, um, the values in, then I think that's a good way to follow. I think we all have our own parts to play in the system. I don't think there's one necessarily um, set of individuals that should be leading the way, although the youth are going to be um, having to deal with a lot of these challenges that have been around for a couple years. So I think the youth and um, the younger generation's voices should be heard at the larger impact. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everyone has their components, and we all need to work collaboratively together to, to go towards what we want. And I also yeah. think, yeah, following up from that really is it is um, to, uh, you know, adapting to a low carbon lifestyle as much as you can, but also engaging with decision makers um, and, you know, as an individual and as a group, you know, joining up with other groups and, and because it, it's, it's, it's not enough just to be green yourself, to live a sustainable life yourself. You need to talk to people about it and talk to people in, in your circle and, your, and also lobby decision makers. Yeah. Alice? I think doing what you can and being really open about the where the limits are of what you can is a form of leadership, actually, because being authentic, it's a point about authentic, being authentic, really, taking your values forward, but sometimes you can't do the thing that you know ought to be done. Mm -hmm. And to be open about that and why you may fall short of the expected amazing standard, I think is really important because that starts to share the fact that we're all doing our best, but there are some fundamental barriers to get around. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think this is, yeah, I think that, that's kind of not claiming the moral high ground. It's the, it's the inverse of that. Nothing will, stop, will prevent, I think, people following you and your actions more than you saying, well, I've got all the answers and I'm right. You know, so actually being a bit more authentic about we're doing our best, what's stopping us doing better. That, I think, is, a, is something that we could okay. do with developing a lot. Interesting. And James, I'm going to 
leave you with the final, the final word with you. If that's well, okay. I'd, I'd, I think I'd probably like to build on Alice's comment, actually. Um, I think kind of tolerance and an understanding of each other's perspectives and where people are on the journey on this stuff and that people do have different constraints and, and reasons why they're not doing each things and uh, various different things. And uh, I, you know, I have kind of noticed that uh, even within the kind of climate movement, there's a lot of kind of bickering, bickering arguing over approaches, all that kind of stuff. So I think that around the initiative, there is a need for kind of compassion and kindness and understanding and taking into account uh, different people's perspectives to come up with solutions that, that work. Yeah. Great. Right. OK, thank you. Um, well, rather remarkably, I think we're on time. Um, and just enough time to say thank you once again to the panel. If we could all show our appreciation for the panel and the excellent insights we've, we've, we've gained from, from uh, listening to your, your comments uh, and thoughts today. Thank you, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat>
It means we can keep you branded, Josie, forever now. You've got to keep cup. Okay, so um, the final category is for best conference paper. Um, the winner of the best conference paper will also be put forward by the university to present their work in the, the 2020 International Campus uh, Network Conference, which is in Switzerland. But because we're sustainable, we've made sure that you can dial in. So it's OK. You don't need to choose your form of travel. Um, and the shortlisted entries are Ejiwo Ikiko, Carolina Zajekni, Drochi Yang, and Nicholas Davison. So they highly commended uh, Nicholas Davison, and the winners are Carolina, Beth, uh, Kathleen, uh, and Holly, all of who have done an amazing job for the University of Leeds. Sorry I didn't read all your names out in the first place, ladies. Um, thank you, and uh, congratulations to all our winners. But also, congratulations to everybody who has, has taken part today. It is, as I said this morning, it is one of my favourite um, days of the year because we really do get to see kind of front and centre the amazing work that, that students in the city do. The diversity of the work presented today has, has been such an inspiration from reducing emissions in refrigerated vans to how you manage eco-anxiety and turn that into positive action um, and I have to say something that I kind of at the moment deal with on a, on a daily basis both for myself and people around the university so it's such an important thing for us to to think about the quality of work and the presentations just gets better and better I have to say the way that you have all gone about presenting your work not just the quality of the work itself has just amazed me I don't know where you get your confidence from at your point in, in your careers. Um, I remember when I was uh, an undergraduate and a postgraduate student, the, the thought of standing up at a conference like this would have absolutely scared me to death. So congratulations to all of you just for doing that, you know, regardless of the conversations that have come out of it. And I hope that you've got something out of doing that process and that you take confidence in yourself to take that forward, both in your academic studies, but in your kind of wider kind of life. It's been really kind of inspirational to see so many of you getting involved in the artwork in, in Parkinson Court and just, you know, interacting with some of these complexities in a very different way. Um, I do want to share just some kind of personal reflections on where we are as, a, as an institution, um, because I know a, a lot of you don't get to see that beyond the kind of the standard communications channels that are afforded to us, which, to be quite, quite frank, are not always that useful. Um, so I guess I just wanted to kind of relay to you and hopefully build your confidence in the, the commitment that exists within the university to take this forward. The world is a really uncertain place at the moment. There are lots of competing forces happening. You know, every day at the moment we see different impacts from the coronavirus. We've got the uncertainties of Brexit. We've got, you know, the uncertainties of where the higher education kind of movement itself is going. But I can absolutely hand on my heart tell you that there has been no unwavering in the commitment that we have as an institution to drive this forward. When the seven principles were launched, the vice chancellor wrote his own column, as he always does, to say this is an obligation. This is not doing something because, oh, it looks good and everybody else is doing it. This is not a choice. We are obliged as an institution that we are, who drives forward the changes that are needed in society, who fundamentally we're here to find the solutions which challenge society. It is an obligation for us to take this forward. It's really not easy at all but that doesn't mean to say we, we shouldn't do it. So I guess what I want to kind of articulate to all of you is that that commitment is there. But the other thing is that we are all part of that community. There is no 
the university that will save the issues. There's no the university that's going to make some weird decisions over here. We're all part of that university. If we take the staff and students out of the university, it doesn't exist. It's a load of empty buildings with no soul. So, you know, reiterating what everybody has said, we have all absolutely got a role to play in this. And we all have to influence the sphere that we have and we can influence. And that sometimes actually might just be asking the challenging questions. So it might be saying, okay, we've got these amazing seven principles, what's happening about it? But it's then getting involved in those seven principles and keeping them live and keeping them critical and keeping it challenged. We are an absolute crossroads, both as society and as individuals, but also as an institution, to make that next step change. And we need to deliver the commitment with that we've put forward. And I just ask you today to be part of that step change, to kind of help us all drive it forward. You've all shown today, more articulately than any of us can do, the range of actions that need to happen to make this change. And we've all got a role to play in that. And I think it's really important that we recognize that, that we are part of a community. You know, we are part of the sustainability movement. You know, whether you want to be, you know, an internal uh, decision maker, whether you want to be part of Extinction Rebellion, whether you want to be an engineer, whether you want to be a policy maker, actually we have to put all of that together to create a jigsaw that is just and fair. So the thing that comes back to me every day is this has to be an inclusive movement. As a university, as an individual, as a city, we have to do this inclusively and fairly. And it, that transition has to be one that is just. So thank you for all bringing your solutions forward to actually help make that happen because it makes me kind of inspired. It also makes my job a tiny bit easier. Um, but also, I guess, be inspired by the fact that we are committed and the fact that we have all of the different universities here in the room today and that you're finding solutions together. Thank you for all taking part in the day. I think it's really important that we take time out of our kind of everyday life to kind of get together. I hope you've made new friends. I hope you've started new conversations and started new ideas that you didn't have this morning when we, we, we had the opening address. But please can I help you that we ask you that you continue to take those forward, continue talking to each other. It doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter what your disciplinary kind of way of looking at the world is. If we all talk to each other to find solutions, we've kind of got half a chance of, of getting to where we need to get to. If you have a solution that you think as an institution, as a community, we can use, share it. Don't be afraid to get on social media, to knock on the, the office door, we're the ones behind the hoardings and the car park that looks like a building site. I promise it's not a building site. There's lots going on inside of it. Just walk in the building, share your ideas. That's, that's what we need. We will drive those forward. So finally, before we, we kind of leave the room, there's a few thank yous that I, I feel that we, we should kind of um, put forward today. I know it's, you know it's about the collective, but it's also about the individuals that have made today happen. So firstly, it's all of you. So thank you for taking part. Thank you for putting your posters forward. I know that putting a, a poster together isn't always the easiest thing. Doing your presentations have been amazing. Thank you to the student architects that work as part of the kind of institutional framework every day, but also have helped pull together the, the conference and make it happen. Um, thank you to all the panel for taking time to, to do that. Um, at least it's not snowing, so that you know, is a bit easier to get here. Um, thank you to Kelly, who will kill me. Kelly is over there. Kelly has basically done everything to make this happen, and without any real stress at all that I've noticed, so it's been all right. Um, but, you know, Kelly has pull, pulled all of this together and pulled the kind of behind the scenes. Um, thank you to the uh, conference and catering for, again, giving us a, a, an amazing setup. So, thank you, everyone. Please do keep your connections going. Please do make a difference. And do remember, we are a community. We are leads. doesn't matter what university you go to. We are leads, and we can make a difference to the challenges that society put in front of us. Thank you.
Just before we all leave today, I just want to introduce um, Megan Worcester, who is president of the Spoken Word Society, um, and she'll be doing a short performance for us. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I felt like I was walking down the aisle, everyone's eyes on you. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Is everyone good? Yeah, cool. Um, I meant to just do like the end bit, so just kind of like wrap up the day, I guess. Um, I'm from Spoken Word Society, so I'm the president. So we do a bunch of, if anyone's been to a spoken word performance, it's not like your regular like English GCSE poetry. It's a bit more interesting, I promise. So this poem's basically based on um, when I was in the voting polling booth from the last um, election bit. Um, I saw a lot of young people in the voting booth and I thought that was really good, you know, seeing young people out there trying to make a difference with their vote. But then I was also thinking like, you know, is voting the only way that we can make a difference? Um, I was kind of just stood there like, Will it actually matter? Is my voice actually going to do something in this way? So it's just exploring the different ways that young people can use their voice. So I hope you like it. For the fifth person queuing in front of me, an assembly line boxing opinions and ideologies into confined choices, I see the young ones. A pale-faced girl, left fist tensed, clutching fingers across crisp ballot paper. Hand sticky, ink transferring to stamp blank skin, voting decisions etched like palm readings, turning a vote into a tossaway choice. But the young ones, they're standing ready. Two lads hang around the back of the line, chatting away, hand stuffing pockets, voices overtaking one another in between inside jokes. Backpacks are heavy with research they've studied since the campaign started, choosing to mark their voices for the next 5p plastic charge knockoff or single use straw replacement. Dust thickens tension like a dense smog, clouding heads in line, a hill range above sea level. As my eyes float towards the clock face, tickly, ticking idly above us, um, sorry, pulse beating to what feels out of rhythm as I edge closer to the front. This isn't the first time I've seen the young ones out in the masses. We've mobilized before. Re we rack up signatures through online petitions, retweet ad campaigns from online newspapers. We even change our Facebook profiles, billboarding slogans reminding everyone which side we're on. But the streets empty noise into a background theater set. Street lights switch off into sleep as rows drain away into sewage pipes, drying out for next day's routine performance. And yet, we got used to the roles given to us. Stage occupied by uniform actors, politically leading each consistent recital while we cheer them on until curtain fall. Stage, pace, stage space shrinks, everyone sidestepping one another to get into audience view, congealing our bodies into shapes, overtaking another character's breath in between lines. Yet we choose not to disrupt the script, shuffle the acts, rewrite scenes, or derail cliffhangers. Instead, we follow as extras, motionless with the backdrop to repeat the same one-liner to be left unheard. Some of us even dress like trees. We stand together, stage left and stage right, thinking we're occupying enough space to be seen, but we're furniture built to be forgotten. I see the young ones fighting along the picket lines, chests shielded with vibrant placard armor, chanting together with swords by their sides, marching to the thud of the dry road ahead of them, street lights spotlighting that every move so everyone knows which side they're on. We interrupt schedules, disturb traffic, so commotion is directed our way, dislocating the order everyone is used to following. I am back in the queue, facing the clock, aware of a man's breath on my neck, heavy and compact, knowing he's next. She hands me paper and a pencil, and I have never felt like my voice could be used for something more. Thank you.